Am oh. I nervous? Okay. So the first question is, have you missed alcohol? And if so, what made you miss it? I have. What's the biggest change that you have experienced after being sober for an entire year? My psychic abilities. Psychic abilities. Care to elaborate? <laughs> You're really interviewing me here, aren't I you? Am. <laughs> the way you're looking at me, it's so weird. Yeah, the the this, I'm... You can basically make furniture float now. That's not what I said, Chris. No, I'm kidding. Do not be an interviewer and a dick that takes things out of context. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'm starting to discover my true calling here. Did it change your relationship with Chris? You seem so triggered reading that. How do you overcome slash deal with dating nerves without alcohol? Should we break up for three months just to see what it's like to go date again? I feel like I have a whole world that I need to discover. Uh, are you going to continue being sober? Do you see yourself drinking again? And if so, what's your boundary? Big question. The Mindspo Podcast. What do you see with your mind's eyes? Welcome back. Let's elevate. Roll your shoulders up and back. Unclench your jaw, elongate your spine as you take a deep breath in, and now exhale. Now take your mind to that person, place, or thing that you have gratitude for, and start to feel into the joy available to you at all times. Elevate into a higher vibration as we expand together and dive in to this conversation. Welcome to the Mindspo podcast. You are tuning in for another episode of Deep Diving with the Souls. And that's all I'm going to say because I'm being interviewed today. And take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually asked you to intro this episode because you are so much better than me at doing the deep dive with the souls. <laughs> It's a whole kit and caboodle. It's so, the inner radio presenter in me, so <laughs> I, know, I know. You are professionally trained, unlike me. So today is a very special episode mm -hmm. because we are celebrating the fact that you've passed the one-year mark of being sober. No alcohol for an entire year. Many opportunities to drink along the way, and mm -hmm. you've held steadfast through it. We actually gathered a whole bunch of questions from the community to ask you just to see how it's been. Why how... am I nervous? <laughs> You're nervous? Well, I've got about 150 questions here, but we're only going to do about 23 of them. <laughs> so very excited. Let's jump right in, shall we? Okay. So the first question is, well done on your one year. Have you missed alcohol? And if so, what made you miss it? I have at points in this journey, I, I think it's it's natural. It's everywhere around us in our society to drink and to party and to celebrate with other people. Alcohol is such a, like a fundamental fabric that weaves our society together when it comes to celebrations. So there have been moments where I've missed kind of being involved in that, but it's, I would say less about the alcohol and more about the tradition or the idea of bringing people together. So yeah, I've missed it in a sense of, I feel like alcohol has a lot of experiences tied to it on an energetic level. Like we were in Lipstadt, for example, in Germany at one point, and I just wanted to have a drink at the German pub with all the people that were drinking. And I wanted to have a Hugo. And that was like a cultural thing or a glass of wine with my parents when I saw them and I hadn't seen them in ages because they, they love wine. And I think that there have been like moments like that, but all in all, for the most part, how people would think I would miss it. I haven't missed it. Fair enough. What's the biggest change that you have experienced after being sober for an entire year? My psychic abilities. Psychic abilities. Care to elaborate? <laughs> I would say intuition. So psychic intuition, like deeper spiritual kind of connection to myself, to everything around me, heightened sensitivity to everyone and everything. There's just been a, like a deep unfolding of that in me and sometimes a scary like awakening of that in, in, in some moments where it's felt like, for example, I had this crazy lucid dream. And remember I told you about that lucid dream that I had? Which Maybe? one do you have? Yeah. 
occasionally. Yeah, so. well, I, I had like a lucid dream that was like really, really intense where I was like in control of everything and I realized it was oh, yes, yes. me to, to practice speaking on stage at this event that I've been like visualizing in my head. And I feel like there have been just like really fundamental cool things that have happened this year that are like really psychic and really in tune. And it's awakened that within me. And I've always had that, but I haven't focused on nurturing that so much and it's not that I've been trying to nurture that but not drinking alcohol has made that just unfold and it's actually scared the shit out of me in some sense in what way you're you're really interviewing me here aren't you (laughs) (laughs) the way you're looking at me it's so weird you doing this to me just think of me as Stephen Bartlett oh no diary of a CEO oh my gosh I'm right (laughs) why has it scared me I think when we waken up to like our powers as as humans, that it can be really confronting to realize just like how in tune and powerful we are and also just how much we are sleeping on our own inner power, on our own intuition. And I think that's been really nerve wracking and exciting at the same time, but it definitely has scared me. I think the moments that I've actually wanted to drink, that has come from like also a fear of, oh, this is getting really intense. I'm getting really psychic. I'm really tuning in with this. And you know, you and I are psychic like crazy with each other. We're telepathic. We're telepathic and it's an, that's a whole thing. And I think that on that's been something that we've had for years and we've had so many like crazy experiences with that. The telepathic thing that you and I have, I have now had that tenfold with so many other things and people and in situations or I'm noticing things or when things that happen that are really full on, I'm like feeling all of it because I, I'm not numbing anything. And it's not that I used to numb myself out with alcohol on a regular basis, but it's now I am so in tune and, and so connected. So yeah, what was the question again? Do you think alcohol is being used in the society to dull humanity's telepathic abilities don't answer that no what was the question (laughs) the question was what's the biggest change that you've experienced after being sober for a year yeah the the the, you can basically make furniture float now that's not what i said chris kidding do not be an interviewer and a dick that takes things out of context do not be like the mainstream media here so what you're saying is (laughs) was this a good idea (laughs) i don't know i feel like i'm starting to discover my true calling here Next question. Was it hard saying goodbye to your old life and your old self? It was easier because when I gave up alcohol, we had just moved here. So I feel like we were starting a new chapter and that was part of the new chapter, like being in a new place, not drinking. By here, she means Uluwatu. In Uluwatu, in Bali. Bali. Correct. Moving around within Bali, yeah. <laughs> so we kind of jumped out of the uh, Changu Changu night, bubble. I mean, it's like, yeah, night and then, life central. Yeah, and then I'm by the beach and I'm mermaiding. So that was great. So I feel like I already kind of started a new chapter while also coming here. There, there are parts of me that I had trouble with letting go a little bit of the identity, which I actually haven't let go of. It. I've just reinvented it. I have always said I'm a meditation teacher, not a saint. That has been like one of my catchphrases, let's call it, ever since I became a meditation teacher. Because I feel like there is this pressure as someone who is in the spiritual space or meditation space or coaching space or light worker space or whatever box you want to put me in. There is this pressure that I have to be perfect and be- and You have to be Gandalf, basically. Y- yeah, I have to have all the answers to everything and, and, and react right in every situa- situation. And people expect me to have the answers. And I am the first person to de-pedestal myself and say, I do not have the answers. I am not your guru. I don't know all always the answer to everything. I am a flawed human trying to figure this thing out. And I really don't like pedestal culture or guru culture or anything like that. And I think we have to be really careful of that. And I do feel that drinking in the past is a way that I have somehow felt I've tried to make myself more relatable because I'm like, yeah, I'm a meditation teacher, but I also party. And when I started drinking, I was worried about that because even like the the intuition psychic thing that I said you the fact that I'm feeling more in tune with myself, it feels like I've been separated from people energetically and I don't want to be separated from people, but like I'm noticing things that no one else is noticing and I feel like I'm- You're it, observing it, more. Yeah, and that's a pressure and that's a difficult thing. That's a thing, part of myself that I'm like, I'm saying goodbye to my more dulled out self and I'm welcoming my more like higher in tune self and in some sense, I'm scared of that version of me because it's a really it's like, intense energy to hold. Is it like you're ostracizing yourself unconsciously because you're 
not going with the mob so much. Yeah. What was the hardest stage? Did you ever nearly cave? Yeah, hundred percent. Two stages: the beginning part, the the beginning part, the second time round. So I, I did six weeks sober, ah, yes. drunk. I have a whole podcast episode on that, and then I did the one year. The beginning part was difficult, and at the end, I have wanted to self sabotage myself in the last two months, and it has been a. Uh, <laughs> I remember you asked me multiple times to give you to to let you off the hook. I was like, Don't I wanted look to, at me. I wanted to, and you stopped, and I I, like, I just kept I'm making comments. Kidding. I I wanted to. I almost wanted someone to be like, yeah, fuck it, because my inner destructive mean girl wanted to to self sabotage sure. myself. I I always have this description that I say to my students and retreats and stuff, which is there has been a girl inside my head, my inner bitch, and she has been riding with me since the day I remember. And she used to be driving the car. So I used to have this inner bitch that was taking the wheel, that she was the one that was taking me on a joy ride and just like completely fucking up my life. Then I got her in the passenger seat. And then eventually I got her in the back seat and she was like backseat driving. And I was just like, yeah, I can hear you, but I'm not listening. Now that inner bitch, she is in the boot of my car taped up with a gobsmacker in her head and sometimes she's banging and telling me what to do and I'm like no I'm in control I can hear you I know that you're here but I'm not listening I think in the last two months of not drinking she got in the back seat again and for the drinking and she was there being like stuff it up don't worry it's like getting to a year was in essence like being a good girl and it was like be a rebel don't make it resistance hits hardest right before the finish line. yeah i think i have an inner want to self-sabotage myself of course. and i think that's a part of humanity yep what positive habits did you add in instead of reaching for alcohol I would say breathwork. I have mentioned this on the podcast before. There is a breathwork instructor called Shiva Rossa. We mentioned her on the 10 Things That Changed Our Life episode. And her breathwork, her rhythmic breathwork has been my go-to thing. If I feel like I need to reach for a glass of wine and it's because I've had a hard day and I want to null out the hard day and just numb myself on the couch, instead of reaching for alcohol, I will do her rhythmic breathwork and I will breathe through it and I will release it somatically. And that process of reaching for breath work and doing that practice for 20 minutes rather than reaching for a bottle of wine has helped me process so many things that I, for years, was using alcohol to suppress like little icky feelings and little things I didn't even think I was using alcohol to suppress, like someone saying something horrible to me online or sending me like a negative DM or somehow reaching out to me in a way that wasn't nice right at night before I'm going about to go to bed or before. I'm about to eat dinner and I'm like, yo, God, the internet is crazy. And then I'd be like, oh, let's get a bottle of wine tonight and just chill or go out and have a vodka soda for sunset. Instead, I'll just be like, wait a blanket, rhythmic breath work, sit there, somatically process it. And that's been my process. Yeah, I suppose it's you're mainly looking for a shift in state and breath work definitely shifts your state. A hundred percent. Very euphorically so. Yeah. And I've also done the visualize success meditation that we've done a bunch of times because that's really helped to visualize. I still feel like sometimes I have alcohol to sabotage myself in the past. And when I go and do my visualize success meditation and I imagine the most successful version of myself, she's not doing that. So thinking about my future self and making decisions as my future self and doing habits and things that my future self would do to deal with these problems. How does your body feel? Do you genuinely feel fresher, clearer, like mentally cleaner? Like how do you feel different now after a year? Yeah, all all of the above. I, I've lost weight in the last year and I don't mean to mention that as like the first like big plus thing, but physically that's probably one of the biggest actual changes because I, I think a lot of people ask me like, oh, have you, your eyes clearer, your skin clearer? My skin is clearer than ever before. I've had less breakouts. I've lost weight in my body and then that's more just like a – I feel – that's also just been kind of like inflammation. In, yeah, inflammation. And more water retention. Exactly what I was looking for. I feel like I'm the 
the leanest I've been and kind of like the most springy I've been ever. And I don't feel like heavy and I don't mean like heavy and like you look heavy or anything like that. That's not what I'm getting at. But I used to feel heavy, even though I didn't, it wasn't like a look thing. It was like a feeling of, oh, my body just feels like it's carrying like a lot of like weight in. in, And that was, I think just, it was carrying a lot of inflammation and I don't have that inflammation anymore. My skin's clearer. My hair's long. My hair has grown so much in the last year. It's crazy. My hair's grown so much. My, yeah, just all in all, I feel the healthiest I've ever been. I guess your body has to deal with so much less toxin. At yeah. the end of the day, alcohol is a toxin. 100%. Know? How long did it take for you to notice the difference mentally? I would say I definitely started noticing things in the first few weeks, but three months after not drinking alcohol, or even it was like, a, I think a month and then three months, I was like, whoa, something's different. Something's different. I feel different. I remember I was saying it to you. I was like, things feel good. And it felt like this flow. So yeah, it was pretty immediate. And it was very, it was a very noticeable shift. And it was interesting because it kept getting better. I think that was a really interesting thing. I think probably from the first month to the six months, there was this instance of every single month, things are only getting better. It's only getting better. Yeah, I do remember that. How did not drinking affect date nights for both of you, both of us? (laughs) I would say this is probably the biggest downside of not drinking. We struggled with date nights. And we haven't really resolved it. It hasn't, we haven't made it like a focus. And it's interesting because, look, I want to preface this by saying you and I have a very unique relationship. We work together. We live together. We're in a foreign country together. We have little date-like moments pretty much every day. Yeah. We're very lucky to have a very close relationship. I think date nights probably when we used to drink, we used to get off the topic of work and things better and easier and maybe just be a little more I don't want to say playful because you and I are playful regardless if we're drinking or not but I feel like we would probably just be a little less introspective in our conversation whereas Mm -hmm. when we aren't drinking I'm just so tapped in tuned on we're so like in this kind of clarity space that it seems I think we're so excited about everything that we're working on. Everything that we're doing comes so much from the heart. You and I have ridiculous amount of passion and like motivation to do things. So when you're with the person that you are building your life with, that you are so excited to build with and you're doing things that like light you both up like you wouldn't believe and you are in a both really clear space having an incredible dinner and you're just like firing on all pistons and you're like in alignment, in your passion, just loving your life. It's kind of hard not to talk about the things that light you up the most because sure. that's what we love discussing and we get like high on life talking about that. But I will say if this is to continue, we probably need to do work on that, you and I. I mean, you know, even if it's not getting drunk, Mm. like just finding some kind of other hobby as our date kind of experience, whatever it is. We've been doing like a sauna and ice bath recovery. We did that the other day. That was really nice. We've been playing cards when we go out to restaurants and cafes. We play cards. That's been a big shift. Taking eggs on Mondays at that French cafe. What's (laughs) it called? I think we've we've done more times together, but we definitely, the going out for dinner has not I been. I feel like we go on breakfast dates. That's what it is. Yeah. Because we ride the scooter together, like we're in the Amalfi mm. Coast or something, <laughs> we're cruising around, and then we play cards instead of scrolling the phone mm. and have like a bougie breakfast sometimes on a Monday. I feel like that's kind of been our replacement in the last year, if I really think about it. hundred percent. Yeah, you're, you're very right. That's it's been, been our dates. It has been our dates. Did it change your relationship with Chris? <laughs> He seems so triggered reading that. Yeah, no. Chris is an absolute dick, guys. He gets a one star on the boyfriend review. No, yeah. Soul's amazing. It hasn't changed our relationship. I I feel like the, the date nights has been like a, a bit of a difference. But like I said, I feel like we've replaced that a little bit. I would like to have more like bougie dinners out together. Movie nights. We have been doing movie nights. We've been doing more like 90s movie nights together, which has been nights. good. It's you been know, a, It's been an education for Rochelle. All in all, Soul has been so incredibly supportive of this, like you have, you really have. And although you did basically the first six months with me and then you've had a few drinks here and there, I think it's, 
I'm being so lucky that you're super supportive. And I think you even said, we said, we're talking about this on the scooter the other day. You haven't actually gotten drunk in the last year. No. You've had like an, an espresso martini to celebrate like an opening of a friend's venue or like your five times I've had like, yeah. Or to see a friend that you haven't drinks. seen in five months. And I think the difficult thing is like, we are on the Island that when people come see us, oh, yeah. like it's, they're here on holidays. They're, they're here to drink. They they're lit. here to party. Yep. Yeah. What made you start this sober journey? Did you have issues with alcohol or was it just an experiment you wanted to try? I started the sober journey because the voice, I have a voice that has guided me through life. It's the voice that told me to become a meditation teacher. It's the voice that's told me to start certain things in my life. It like kind of comes to me that going back to the intuition thing I was talking about earlier, there is a voice that has always kind of given me guidance. And it's and not my voice. It's not Soul's voice. It is a... <laughs> We had a fight about this the other day. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> oh, did. we can get into that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the voice came to me and it told me that I needed to stop drinking while I wrote this self-love and healing manual, which I wrote. And then after that, it told me that I needed to just stop drinking for a year. I've always listened to the voice. I always follow what the voice does when I listen to my intuition, when I listen to that voice of my higher self incredible, magical things happen. It's how my life has unfolded in the way that it has, I believe, because I really trust that guidance from whatever it is. So it was a curious experiment guided by my intuition. And if you'd like to know more, we have a podcast episode that we're going to put down in the show notes. And that is the first podcast that I did on my sober journey. And it really documents the first eight months. So it goes into the whole process of starting, my opinions when I first started. And I feel like it's going to give everyone like a really nuanced, just insight into the beginning of this journey, as well as some of my past. I have like alcoholism in, in my family and I have experienced a lot of trauma with alcohol. However, I have always had a really positive relationship. So I myself don't have any issues with alcohol. I've always been like a really good drinker apart from one New Year's Eve where so will tell you that I was a rip roaring drunk idiot. Oh, it's been a couple of times. <laughs> you, Rochelle's one of those sleeper cells, you know, there's, I feel like there's different people who have different react differently. There's like, there are people like me where you can tell exactly where I'm at. When I'm at a four out of 10, I'm a master at pool. When I'm at a six out of 10, I'm making everyone laugh. When I'm at an eight out of 10, I'm, I'm dancing like an idiot. Mm. But with you, you, can't you cannot tell. tell anything until yeah. it's too late. Like you look, you are, you, and you tell people you're like, no, 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 I'm totally fine. And then suddenly you're a nine out of 10. I think that's a so, trauma response of always like, being honestly, in control. You've just, it's, but I will say. It's how we ended up together. <laughs> <laughs> One night stand when I was very drunk. Yes, one, one um, night stand. Best one night stand ever. But <laughs> I think as well, that's something I, I've always, apart from like a few instances in my life, I I am the sort of person that if everyone's out drunk and something happens. Yeah, you're the caretaker. If it, it, even if I'm drunk and something happens and people need help, oh gosh. You're the sitter. I go into robot mode when there is issues and drama and things yeah. that I need to deal with, you will see me completely shut down with no emotion Total and just go trauma. through the motions. And trauma that's response. that's my trauma response. Yeah. And that's just, I think I've been through so many instances in my life uh, in danger when I was really young that I, I just turn into a robot to systematically protect myself and shut down. And I'm really proud of that part of me because that part of me has protected me in so many situations. It's I think I used to really judge that part of me and criticize that part of me if other people had an issue with it or whatever. But it's like I, I've i just learned that that's how my inner child dealt with things and that's also how I got myself to safety and, and manage things. And I think that's, yeah, it's just kind survival of- Survival mode. Yeah, survival mode, literally. What's the one drink you crave the most? An amaretto sour. Oh, yes. <laughs> All I want is an frothy- Amaretto sour Some with egg white, slivers. with like really good disarono. Mm. I want, but I don't want just any amaretto sour. I want Punji, Punji who works in Ubud, who used to work oh, yes. at Romeo. He used to work at Dar Romeo. He now works in Ubud. I want to go and see Punji, who makes the best amaretto sour. I he still works there at, he, at Aperitif. I've never been there. But maybe I need to have my first drink at Aperitif because he, was, yeah. he is an incredible bartender. He made a, he made a great And I love De Serrano. De Serrano, what, what does it taste like? It tastes like almonds. Almonds. It's almond liqueur. Oh, it's amazing. I know. And I don't think I've I haven't found any mocktails that taste like an amaretto sour. So I really miss yeah. amaretto sours. Yeah, that's so good. 
What was your go-to non-alcoholic beverage when you fancied alcohol? In the last few months, it has been a Polaris soda water, preferably when I'm in a rock pool at Dreamland Beach at low tide, sitting in blue ice water, drinking a very bubbly soda water, and it is the best. Yes, it's not fancy at all. It costs 65 cents at Pepito. I am a basic bitch at the end of the day. And the branding is definitely nothing to... But, hey, it does the job. It gives you that nice, fresh, bubbly. It's kind of like champagne almost with no no headache. The bubble to water ratio in that is off the chain. It's uh, honestly, I I really feel like I I'm, I tried to find them on Instagram. I couldn't find them on Instagram. I was I, like, if I'm these if these guys had Instagram, <laughs> I would be giving them so much free promo. They're not in the influencer culture <laughs> realm. That's not how they're making their money. What was your response when people asked why you weren't drinking? I told people that I was doing a one year experiment and that yeah, that that was basically it. Okay. Were there any events you went to that you wished you could drink at? Like, how did you navigate that? In the moments you wanted a drink, how did you navigate that? Yeah, there were moments. The minute that I wanted to drink, I immediately ordered myself a mocktail or something that looked like a drink. Because I feel like when you're out and you want to drink, you have to get a drink. And it just has to be like a non-alcoholic drink. And by the time you drink that non-alcoholic drink, basically all the anxiety of people telling you to drink goes. So like I'd get a ginger beer or I would go and have like a nootropic drink or anything that was there and have that, drink that. And that would just really help me get me through. And yeah, there were moments that I wanted to drink. I think strangely, when I went sailing with my parents, like my parents do Friday night sailings and we saw them earlier this year. And I had a very strong craving to drink then, like to have a glass of wine of course, with my parents and the their family. Yeah. And sitting around. My parents drink really nice wine. And I think that would have been really nice. Yeah, to be with my dad and my stepmom and have a drink with them. And yeah, there were moments that like my friends were DJing or doing something or I was out with people that would have been really nice. But I, I think what I was enjoying exploring more was being sober. Yeah. Were there people who didn't accept your decision about being sober? Did any of your friends make you feel pressured to drink? Probably, but I just didn't give a shit. (laughs) I'm really at this. and And I think for some people, they probably don't have that kind of relationship with their friends or with themselves yet, maybe. But I'm just at this thing. Like if you don't I'm doing me. If you don't like me, that's fine. Just see you later. I I always say peer pressure doesn't work on me. I'm just at this stage in my life where nothing that anyone would have said to me, like there wasn't going to be any external pressure from someone else to drink. The only pressure that I really felt was pressure within me. I'm very lucky with our social circle. I think most people generally were really, really supportive. And I also, big thing I want to say, I mentioned last podcast, I was not preachy. I'm not preachy. I wasn't there like trying to convince everyone. I would only talk about it it being sober if people were curious, which most people were. They wanted to know how it was going. But I wasn't doing this, oh, look at me. I'm not drinking. I'm so amazing. Like that, you're going to get people that are going to judge you. They're going to want to sabotage you. So you just have to just let people do them and you just do you. How very Libra of you. (laughs) Yeah, three times Libra. Yeah, triple Libra over here. It's pretty easy. What are the greatest challenges standing in your way while manifesting? Let me guess, you often forget about what you want, your mind jumps all over the place, and as abundant and high vibe as you want to be, you keep catching yourself falling back into lack, stress, and thinking small. I know this because I face those challenges too. But guess what? There's an app for that and it's called Manifesty. And we actually spent two years developing it to help you overcome all of those challenges. With Manifesty, you can keep your vision board in your pocket so that inspiration is never far from your mind. You can also make a vision board feed just like Instagram, but way more productive. And you can even make a vision board movie, which is an upgraded vision board because you can use music to really help you get into an altered state and heightened emotion. Besides that, you can also practice meditation to build your attention span and self-awareness, keeping your mind more on positive thoughts, gratitude, and thinking in expanded ways that keep those manifestations flowing. There is so much in one app to help you with your manifestation journey. And if you love this podcast, then I know you will love this app. You can download it right now for free. And if you choose to subscribe, it's also one of the best ways that you can support us here at Mindspo to keep doing the work that we do. Find it now on both app stores by searching Manifesty. That's Manifesty. 
Manifest IE and start your free trial today. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the episode. Did you observe some changes in your skin and body? Have you noticed any changes in your appearance? I think you mentioned that before. Yeah, hair, weight loss, better skin, less acne, generally feeling better, clearer eyes. Your eyes are very blue these days. I noticed that the other day. I was like, whoa, mine are all brown and murky. And I'm like, are mine meant to be blue underneath all of this? No, I think, yeah, all all of those things. And I want to say as well, for the first time, this year I felt like I really stuck to a fitness regime because when you're not getting drunk and when you're not kind of falling on the wagon, falling off the wagon, I have ever since my ear infection, which I'll do a whole nother podcast episode on, ever since I had like a pretty severe ear infection that landed me in hospital, which happened during this whole thing, I have been obsessed with walking. Walking has been my absolute like self-medicine and I feel that it's been so incredible just to be really committed to walking and Pilates and mindful movement and to not have anything that's standing in the way of that. How do you manage nights out when alcohol is a big part of the group? How do you deal with social pressure when you go out (coughs) and people ask if you want a drink? Get a drink, get a mocktail immediately and just be on your own vibe. Look, I will say I haven't really gone out that much in this time phase. I've been really kind of in my own little world, hanging out with Chris, doing our own thing, and I'm just not really bothered by that. And I think that's just where I'm at in my life. I will say that if you feel this pressure to drink and you're around people where that like, that is like a big kind of – like a big vibe of the group – there would have been situations if that was the, the case that I probably just wouldn't have gone to those situations or I would have tried to catch up with those people in like a situation that wasn't so challenging if that was a challenge of mine. If I can give a, a pointer, this is what I used to do when I used to go out. If every <clears throat> few drinks I'd want to have a water because I just know that that's better so that I'm not totally hung the next day. So all I'd always say to the bartender is, can you give me a soda water but make it look like a vodka lime soda? And then they just go, got you. And then there you go, got your little mint leaf and your lemon and your ice and the same glass as everyone Mm. else. And then you're just undercover sober, Mm. which is great. Nice and easy. Nice. How do you overcome slash deal with dating nerves without alcohol? Oh, I wish I had dating nerves. How to overcome. Should we break up for three months just to see what it's like to go date again? I feel like I have a whole world that I need to discover. A whole new world world of dick. Of dick. (laughs) I've been with the same penis for 12 years. When is there going to be a new one? I love the one I've got. (laughs) <laughs> but I just really want to see. Don't, don't go to karaoke because I don't know. I don't like your chances. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my strong suit singing. No, I love the penis that I'm with. I'm not looking for a new one. I'm making jokes and making. Hear that, everyone? Back off. This one's mine. <laughs> This chicken's mine. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a, a, a one pathway with that. I'm committed to one for the rest of my life, and I love you very much. Yes, humans um, are not monogamous, but we make it work. I want to say something that someone said on my retreat about dating, and I don't know if it really answers this question, but it's the only advice I have on dating, and I just loved it. And she was talking about this student of mine, and I told her I was going to teach this, so thank you so much for sharing it with me. She was talking about dating, and they were just all discussing dating, and I found it fascinating because I'm obviously not in that world, and I'm just like, whoa. We're a pre-Tinder couple. It's a a jungle out there. What are these like? No wonder people need this work more than ever. This is this is some heavy shit. Yep. And she said something that I loved. She goes, I don't go on first dates. I was like, oh, okay. She goes, I have encounters. And I was like, encounters? Mm. And it was this concept that rather than having to put this pressure on it being a first date, it was just an encounter. And then she said by date two or date three, that's when she called it a date. So she would go on these encounters with people and it just took the pressure off. I thought that was next level genius. So if I was you and I was nervous about going on first dates without drinking, I would just use it as an encounter. And So would you text the guy and be like, would you like to have an encounter? No, like he might think it's a first date, but for you, you would just have it as an encounter. So that's how you would overcome your own dating nerves. But like, I mean, you know, 
I'm not I, I qualified guess, to answer this question, right. Chris. <laughs> That's what we're getting it's, at. It's actually really simple. That was the it's only advice I had. Meditate. <laughs> just meditate before you go out and you won't need booze. I, just be quiet and calm and still. Play cards. <laughs> play cards. <laughs> Honestly, thank God I'm not dating because I would just suck Vape, at this. CBD. <laughs> Can you imagine me dating? Yeah, of course. Really? You're very desirable. Yeah, and you love to talk. There you go. Problem solved. I bet people would be like, red flag, this woman doesn't shut up. No, God, you're a green flag all the way. Give me a break. Interesting. Right. Has this- <laughs> No, totally. You're just a red flag parade. Just don't even try. <laughs> Has this year changed your relationship with alcohol? If so, how? Yeah, forever. Mm. It'll never be the same. Yeah. And what a beautiful thing. Yeah. What a beautiful thing to wake up from the mirage that is a fabric of society that I feel like so many of us don't see. I really encourage anyone that is sober curious or wants to experiment with this to really explore this way of existing because there is a whole nother world that involves so much beyond alcohol and alcohol is just one kind of level of reality. And I feel like when you stop drinking, you open up all these other levels, all these other things, and you see yourself in a different way. You have a deeper relationship with yourself. You see society in a different way. And it is a very interesting thing to to experiment with. I feel like consciousness at the end of the day is we are expressions of consciousness. And when it comes to alcohol, alcohol is a consciousness shifting thing. It is a substance that shifts our consciousness. So to take alcohol out of your consciousness and to be without it for a whole entire year, you will experience a different level of consciousness. You will experience yourself in a new way. And you're only here as you once in this life. You have one shot at being you. So why not explore all the different facets that you can be? And you might love sober you so much more than the version of you that you have been existing in with alcohol. So it has changed my relationship with myself forever. It's changed relationship with alcohol forever. I feel now I just have these blinders that were on since I was eight, you know, 18, 21. I only really started drinking properly when I was 21. Those the programming would have started before then though. Yeah, you know? but the, my blinders are off now and I, I just see it in a different way. I have a less attachment to it and a more observation of it and it's really, really interesting. Isn't it wild that with the mental health condition of this planet, we would grab something that we literally label a depressant? Like it's literally yeah. called a depressant. <laughs> Yeah. And we use that to manage our depression. It's like, it's, okay. It's wild. Talk about fighting fire with fire. Are you going to continue being sober? Do you see yourself drinking again? And if so, what's your boundary? Big question. Hmm. It's changing every day, which is really interesting. The day that I got to one year sober and had a hard week and I joked to soul like, oh, maybe this is my sign that I need like a glass of wine. And I knew that that wasn't actually what I wanted to do. It was just this like old programming. I know it's not going to help anything. And I think that now when I feel low, alcohol will be the last thing that I reach for ever in my life. There will never be a time that when I'm of sound mind that I will reach for alcohol because it's been like a tough day. Like I will, maybe I will have alcohol when things aren't going great again or whatever, but it wouldn't have been my first option. It'll be like, because I'm out with people. So I guess that answers my question. Am I going to stay sober forever? I am not someone that puts labels on things. I think even having a label of being sober for me was a big thing. I feel like I didn't really want that like label of myself, but I was like willing to put it out there. I think I will drink again, but it will, if I'm honest, it's it's probably just to reset the counter, just to take the pressure off this kind of like countdown thing. The perfect streak. The pit perfect streak kind of thing. I, I just want to just break it to just kind of just go, oh, you know, I did that. And does that mean that I'm going to go back to drinking how I used to? No. I think alcohol is going to be such a less part of my life. I really think moving forward, I was thinking about this today. I, I like the idea of doing kind of sober or alcohol-free sprints. So having like three months a year or a quarter a year or two quarters a year or six months a year where I go, yup, that's it. I'm doing six months sober again because I've proven to myself that I could do it. And the interesting thing is that I actually think that if I 
wanted to, I could never like pick up a drink ever again in my life from this point moving forward. Like I'm at the point where I'm just so indifferent to it. It's not an issue. Like I could do that. If someone said like, you have to do this for the rest of your life, I'd be like, okay. Like it's not really a concern for me. So I feel like I'm very detached with it. And because I'm detached with it, I don't want to have an attachment to being sober. I just want to have more of a detachment to the whole experience. I think it's interesting to sometimes alcohol, I feel there are certain people and situations that I feel it brings me closer. I I do want to sit with my dad on his boat and have a really nice glass of wine with my parents or have a really nice, like share a really nice glass of red with my dad and my stepmom when my stepmom's cooked like a really nice meal. She's a chef. So I I do want to potentially, you know, cheers. And one of our really good friends is a DJ. And do I want to go out to one of his amazing DJ gigs and have a vodka soda with everyone and not be in that super clear psychic kind of thing that I am in and just kind of be in that more humanness. And I think, I don't think that you have to drink to be in your humanness, but it is because alcohol isn't actually a problem for me. I'm interested in experimenting. I also, to be honest with you, this was an experiment. This was really an experiment. I want to really see, I'm actually so excited to see what it's like after the first drink. Like I might have my drink go out and you might get me on the podcast and we'll do an episode after I have had a drink. And I might be like, guys, it is the shittest thing ever. Never do it again. Or I might be like, oh, I want to integrate it. I don't know. I think this is part of the experiment for me as someone that's putting themselves out there to be like a puppet for this, to tell people what this feels like and to take people on this journey. And that's one of the most beautiful things about having a podcast and having an audience and to be able to be that that person. So what was the question again? Are you going to continue being sober? There we go. That's yes. my answer. Right. I, I, <laughs> Look at you. You're getting so frustrated like, with well, me. <laughs> I think, you know, I think for me it's, it's like special occasions mm-hmm. where you want to mark a special occasion and just be part of that moment. I think that's nice. Or otherwise just send it and deal with the consequences and just be like, all right, I'm going to down a liter of alkaline water before I go to bed and make sure I I try to undo the damage. And then I signed up for this, but it's not, oh, it's Friday, time to drink. Oh, I'm on a plane, time to drink. It's a birthday, time to drink. Can I get into this? When you say consequences, this is the thing that I really think about because, for example, I'll expand on the psychic thing that has been huge for me. I'm really interested to see when I drink again is a lot of that going to... How long is your telekinesis diminished? I would say it's probably going to be weeks. It's not days. Mm-hmm. That's. I mean, for, for me, when we had the six weeks of no drinking initially and then we had that one big night out, the big revelation for me was that... Because I remember right before that, we were like, wow, six weeks, and I feel so clear, clearer than ever before. I don't think I'd ever gone six weeks without a single drink maybe, at least not paying attention to it. And I remember it took more than five days after that one night out. And it wasn't Mm. even a like, I'm drinking until I'm in the toilet situation. Mm. I was like six out of 10, seven out of 10, had like six, seven, eight cocktails. Here's the thing though. It took a week before I I could sense the hangover fully being gone. So like, can I say, so how you're talking this, like being really... I'm talking you out of it right now. Like, so right? You 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 know that there is something that I, I'm going to share soon that I'm working on yeah. that yeah. I actually – I don't know if I will drink until after this now Maybe. because there is a part of me that – You've got a real clear 4K signal right now um, to to your – you know, your transmission up there. So it is a question. It's crazy Is it worth though. it? You know, is it worth it's it? Not, to, oh, I can answer that question. It's like, not. It's not. No, it's not. But then there's a part of me that just wants to. Maybe just have one drink to be like, all right, I broke the streak. Now I, it, the pressure's off, but you don't have to go when we go out next weekend or something, you don't have to send it like I probably will. <laughs> you right. can be my sitter. <laughs> You can drive us. Oh my god, I'm so deep in thought right now. I'm like processing. <laughs> I, I don't. All right. So mm. we're we're at forty something minutes on the podcast. We've got a couple more questions. Let's go. What advice would you give to someone who is curious and mm. thinking about going sober? Do it. Do it. Do it. 
do it, you live once, experiment with your flesh puppet, experiment with your soul, your abilities, your humanness. I, I think that just like you've been experimenting with drinking and just like you're seeing what you're like as someone who drinks alcohol, experiment with what you're like when you don't drink alcohol. Get curious. The best things in your life will happen when you are curious, when you play with the channels. Curiosity is what has made humanity and this whole entire earth experience so interesting. Everything that has ever happened that is cool in life is from someone's curiosity. So follow your curiosity always. Love that. And then the final question is, where do you think you'd be today if you didn't take the sober path? There are three things that have happened this year that I don't think would have happened if I didn't decide to be sober. Number one is this podcast. This podcast, I started this podcast when I had been sober for a little bit. And my biggest fear with starting this podcast was that I didn't believe that I had self-discipline and I didn't believe that I was someone that was consistent. Those were two of my old limiting beliefs that old Rochelle had been holding up that had stopped me from becoming the person who creates a podcast. Through becoming sober, I started to realize my ability to be consistent, my ability to be disciplined, my tap thinness and the downloads, all of that. I felt like when I started the podcast, it wasn't this energy of, oh, I'm not going to know what to say. I was like, yo, I'm like, I've got a straight pipe to whatever that is. That's just the thing that's coming at me. I'm not worried. It felt like there was an abundance and that I wouldn't have started the podcast if I, I don't think the podcast or, and I, I might've started it, but I don't think it would have been as consistent. And just so you guys know, I definitely have an attachment <laughs> to doing this podcast twice a week because it is me proving to my past version of myself that I'm doing that. And I want to keep that up for quite some time. And one day I probably won't do it because we all need to take breaks, but I'm in a season of showing myself, showing my past self that I can do this. I am doing this. Fucking watch me. So yeah, it's all just me proving it to my past self. What's the second thing that would The second thing is a thing that I can't talk about that I'm going to talk about soon. What's the third thing? You said there were three things. Yeah, the the, the, the third thing, like what was the exact question again? So I can word it properly. Where would where do you think you would have been now if you hadn't taken the sober path? I think the third thing is that I would probably be less in a season of work and dreams and things unfolding. I'd probably be more in a season of, I don't want to say go with the flow because I have been going with the flow, but I probably wouldn't be taking some of the things that I'm doing so seriously. I, I'm really in a chapter of taking a lot of the things that I do for work seriously. And what I mean by that is I really take recording meditations very seriously. I, I take creating content for Manifesty very seriously. I take everything that I put out into the world with a with a very, like a playfulness always and a, an element of fun and an element of ease, but also an element of like a higher responsibility. And I feel like that has even deepened from not drinking. And I think that's a beautiful thing because I really love what I do. So I think I would probably, I'm in Bali guys. Like I, I could be living the biggest YOLO freaking life. All of things would all be happening still and unfolding money. And like, there wouldn't be any change, but I could literally be getting out and going drunk every single week. And I've built a life of myself for years where I'm completely free. Forget I don't know about the weekend every day. Yeah. I don't have Bali, a holiday destination. I don't have a boss that that I respond to, like everything that I do is that. Excuse it- me. Oh, fuck off. Uh, go, <laughs> go fuck yourself. Honestly, no, you're not my fucking boss. You are my partner <laughs> and you know that. <laughs> Managing partner. <laughs> no, I, if I wanted to, I could be drinking and still, ma- like I, I could be drinking and still getting all this shit done and it wouldn't be any yeah. issue and we'd be surviving and it'd be fun. And you wouldn't be nowhere near as consistent. I as have so been. much self-discipline and so everything that I do is so self-motivated. No one is telling me to do any of this. There's no one kicking me up the ass to do two podcast episodes a week. Like I am fully in control of my own reality. My core belief for years has been, I create my own reality. Everything that I have ever created and everything that I do is because I decided it. It's because I visualized it. It's because I had a, a desire to make it happen and I've, I've made that unfold. And I I have a lot of like self-discipline with that. And if I was drinking, that self-discipline wouldn't and that consistency wouldn't be there. So I wouldn't be as forward momentum going. So basically, if you really want to sabotage my success and get me drunk. <laughs> basically. And do it regularly. But not even my success. Just if I want to sabotage my my work 
or my mission. That's it. I'm very mission led and it's not my success. My success is seeing other people thrive and the ripple effect that it has on other people's lives. It's very much related to the mission and, and the, the continued effect that this work has. And if, and I, I do think I can do this while drinking, but maybe not in this chapter. And if I did, it just, it will just be done in a different way. I, I also just want to say one thing. There are now certain situations when I do go back to drinking. Like, for example, here's one. I would never drink before public speaking in my life ever again. If I had to do like a speech at a seminar or whatever, and ever all the people are going out the night before, you best believe I'm not doing that. And if I am, someone needs to kick me up the ass. I will never drink on a retreat ever again. And we run sober retreats. And that's a huge part of what I do. Like I'm so big on if you are doing the work and you're working on healing stuff, you need to not be drinking. So there are certain things that are very uh, different now. What, what was that line from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey? Sharpen the saw. Mm. This is literally like you're dulling the saw before mm. you need it to be sharp, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. fucking stupid. It sounds like it's been a very good decision to, to try this sober, sober experience. Here with my water. Cheers, hey, baby. H2O for the win. Well, those are all the questions that How I have How was it for you interviewing today. me? Did you enjoy that? It was actually quite good. Yeah. Was it? We want to do it again? <laughs> yeah, I can interview you on something else. <laughs> mm. I like the whole uh, people submitting the questions. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's really, really, that okay. makes this so much, so easy. Mm -hmm. My job right now is literally just to not interrupt you. If you listen to this podcast and you want us to interview each other or you want us to do a questions asked episode or you have questions that you wanted to be asked, maybe just send a DM to Mindspo. So our team will be able to manage that. So if you have like a, a an interview series that you want, or you want me to interview Sol on something, or you want me to be How interviewed on something. How would a DM something. like this be structured exactly? I don't know. Hey, Rochelle, I really enjoyed the Sobar interview. I'd love Sol to interview you about what you've learned insert about topic here. insert topic. Right? Yeah, it's it's fun when it's crowdsourced. Yes. Okay. Are you going to wrap this episode, or am I? I am perplexed. I'm so deep in thought over if I am going to go another, what how long would it be? Another wait, year almost? No. Oh, wait, be just wait yeah. October, November, December, Next January, June. February. It would be another four to five months. Longer than that. No, for what I need to actually be so before, it be four to five months. I think you can allow yourself a glass of wine if you want and then continue on for another six months. Just so that you can kind of take the tension out of it a little bit. So but maybe I like the tension. I think you do. <laughs> I think you do. Maybe, maybe you're I'm. In a, you're in a masochist is coming out there. I'm not a ma. Could you not call me a masochist? Do you know what a masochist is? It doesn't sound like a nice thing. I don't. But I don't it's somebody who like likes pain. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I do like an ice bath. I do. I do mm. like how. Yeah. I like putting my – I like to show myself – see it in the shower when you turn it to scalding hot and you're like, <laughs> like, who are you? <laughs> I like to remind myself that I'm strong hmm. because I think I've been in many situations. Oh, your skin is melting in the oh. shower. <laughs> yeah. I think it's when you, you've been in situations where you felt weak, I think you want to feel strong. I love feeling strong. I love feeling like I can like mentally and physically like handle. I love an ice bath because I – or breath work or something because I, I like to move. I love the feeling of transmitting and transmuting pain. I think that that is such a powerful thing to be able to put yourself in situations that you show yourself like, yeah, fuck, I can handle that. Totally. It just makes me feel more like if you want to come at me, yeah, I got it. All right. <laughs> What? On that note. <laughs> no, but like you, you know that about me. I'm not that kind of person though. I mean, I'm very balanced, but I, I like to feel like I can handle things. I know that. Don't you like to feel like you can handle things after an ice bath or something? No. You don't like the, the you don't like the pain? I love the pain. I, I want to feel the pain and I want to get through the pain and be like, oh, I did that. Yeah. I haven't gone I haven't gone the full David Goggins just yet. I love David Goggins. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to run a marathon next. Can you imagine if I become like a sober marathon running? Like a sober marathon running. I don't know. There's just something about being sober and running marathons and like blistering feet that I'm like. I'll be right behind you in a golf buggy <laughs> cruising. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, mm -hmm. this has been an interesting episode, a little bit of a different format. 
I hope you feel inspired to perhaps play with the dials in a new way, mm -hmm. maybe not changing the, the channel necessarily with ye old beverage and maybe trying something else such as Shivarasa's breathwork or meditation or going for a walk or anything else. Like you said before, it's all about curiosity. If everyone's going right, maybe go left and see what's there. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I think we've seen that for you at least in the last year, there's been a lot Mm -hmm. in that opposite direction. Yeah. I think as well, just have fun. Be curious. This is what life is all about. Yes. Don't judge people. Let people be what they're going to be. Let people exist how they're going to exist. I think whatever you do, do it without judgment and just with curiosity and through the lens of love. And at the end of the day, we're here for however long we're here. So just have some fun with it. Yep. And on that note, you should wrap this up because I have no idea what you usually say. My brain's just gone totally blank. Share this wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to the Deep Diving with the Souls podcast. You can with, do it. Come on. Yeah, let's whatever. go. All right. Let's go. Make sure. <laughs> I think the biggest thing I would say, guys, is if you enjoyed this episode, please share it out. I yes. think that sober living is such an interesting topic. I feel like it is something that a lot of people don't speak about. And I, I've also gotten a lot of feedback that there's not many people out there that have done it as an experiment that maybe haven't had struggles with alcohol. So yeah, go and share this out. And if you are someone that struggles with alcohol, then please reach out for help and please go and speak to someone and, and get in touch with AA. And I think that I have such a reverence for AA as someone that used to go to a lot of AA meetings as a kid and I'm really really proud of anyone that is on this journey for whatever it is whether it is because you are recovering or because you are just curious I'm sending you so much love and light I appreciate you guys sharing this message out and just having other people explore this way of living or just see what it's like to do it for a year as always Sol and I are sending you so much love enjoy the pain <laughs> and we'll see you in the next one over and out Thank you for joining me for this episode. You can discover more from Mindspo on Instagram and TikTok by following at Mindspo and myself at Rochelle underscore Fox. If this episode inspired you, then please pass it on and share the love. And if you're new to our world and you want to elevate your mind and step into your best self, then be sure to download our app Manifesty from the App Store and take advantage of the free trial. With Manifesty, you can create your own vision board movies, practice powerful meditations, and set affirmation reminders so your phone supports your journey towards that abundant vision of your future. And lastly, always remember, you create your own reality. So go and make some magic. Thank you.